Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second regulation update for Q1 2019. We're here with Phil Yeager to fill you in on the continuation of these changes, and we hope that this information is valuable for you. And we'll pass it over to Phil. You can cough. Um, we'll pass it over to Phil Yeager. Well, everyone, thank you very much for watching. And I just want to mention I'm getting over a cold, except that I can't get over the cough. So I'm trying not to uh, pass that on to you through the internet, which is impossible. All right, now, last time I talked about the changes that affect the individuals. And now let's talk about the business tax changes. Well, the one thing is for C corporations, it dropped the rate to 21%. 21%, all right, that's the top rate. And then remember, under the old tax act, the top rate was 35%. So beginning in 2018, please remember that the top rate for corporations on their taxable income will be 21%, all right, except the, instead of the 35% we had. The other thing is there was a reduction of the dividend received deduction percentages. Current law provides a corporate deduction of 80% of dividends received if the corporation owns at least 20% of the distributing corporation and 70% otherwise. So what happened was these deductions were reduced to 65% and 50%. So please remember, if you own 20 to 79% of a company and they pay you out dividends, your dividend received deduction would be 65% of those gross dividends. If you own less than 20%, then what happens is the dividend received deduction now is now 50%. We went from 80 to 70% to 65% and 50%. Just to repeat, if you own 20 to say 79%, the dividend received deduction is 65% of gross dividends. And if you own less than 20%, the dividend received deduction is now 50%. And that's starting in 2018. Another thing which was really very helpful to corporations is that they are no longer subject to alternative minimum tax. So just remember corporations, C-Corps are not subject to alternative minimum tax. Now, S-Corps never worried about AMT because S-Corps are like a what? Partnership and they generally don't pay taxes. So there was no AMT for S-Corps, but C-Corps effective on January 1st, 2018, the alternative minimum tax is no longer to be calculated. Now, we know that if you buy personal property used in a trade of business, you can actually expense a portion of that cost immediately under section 179. What's the deal? For tax years beginning after December 31st, 2017, the annual deduction limit for section 179 has been increased from 500,000 to a million. The limit on purchases have increased to 2.5 million. Remember the maximum section 179 you can get for 2018 and thereafter is now $1 million. But for the purchases in excess of two and a half million, for every dollar you go over two and a half million, you lose $1 of the million, section 179. If you have a farm business, what happens is now starting in 2018, any type of tangible personal property, equipment, machinery, placed in service in that farm, starting on January 1st, 2018. Now you can take 200% declining balance and write it off over a five year period. The old rule was for machinery and equipment for a farm, it was 150% declining balance. The next thing is this, for property placed in service after December 31st, 2017, we now have a separate definition for qualified leasehold improvements qualified restaurant improvements, and qualified retail property improvements. The bottom line is we now call this 
leasehold improvements, qualified leasehold improvements. Now, what happens is starting as of 1118, the property can now be depreciated over a 15 year period using the straight line method. And also you can get a half year convention on that. So in the first year, you take a half year convention. So remember all leasehold improvements, whether it's in a restaurant, uh, another business other than a restaurant, or even your office, it's 15 year write off straight line. And don't remember, don't forget, don't remember. No, you gotta remember. Don't forget, it's half year convention. Now, the next thing for tax years beginning after December 31st, 2017, net interest expense is limited to 30% of a business's AGI. Just remember that. If you have interest expense, you take the interest expense. And now you can only deduct 30% of the business's adjusted taxable income. That's a new rule. Now, the net operating loss, that's been modified, which says any type of net operating loss that you have effective after December 31st, 2017, you can only do what now? You can only carry forward net operating losses and you can carry forward them indefinitely. That's a nice thing. However, there is a limitation on your net operating loss deduction if you carry it forward. The limitation is this. The net operating loss deduction is limited to 80% of your taxable income. Net operating loss deduction is limited to 80% of your taxable income. The other thing is with like-kind exchanges, you used to be able to what? Exchange personal property, real property used in a trade of business for the same like kind. So personal property for personal property, real property for real property in a trade of business. Well now, effective for January 1st, 2018, like kind exchanges will only be limited to real estate used in a trade of business. It no longer includes personal property, all right? And to move on here, we have pass through rules. Now, there's a new deduction for certain pass-through income. Currently, income that passes through to a partner comes from a partnership. Because remember, a partnership is a flow-through entity. So if the partnership has any ordinary income, it flows through and it's taxed at the partnership level. Also, an S-corporation is considered a flow-through entity, and so is a sole proprietorship. Now, we have a new section in the Internal Revenue Code, and that's section 199A, 199A. And what that does, it provides a 20% deduction from individual income tax rates for qualified business income from a partnership, S corporation, or sole proprietor for non-corporate taxpayers. Now, the QBI, known as the Qualified Business Income, is generally net income from a business minus any reasonable compensation, minus any guaranteed payments if it's a partnership, and any other payments to the partners or owners for services other than, uh, you know, it's for services. That's basically it. So qualified business income is defined as net income from your business minus any reasonable compensation paid to your employees, guaranteed payments, and I would say that is the net qualified business income. Now, please remember that, to make this simple, you get a deduction of 20% of the qualified business income, and that deduction is shown on your 1040, just like you used to take personal exemptions. It's a reduction of your taxable income. Please remember, it's only for businesses whose owners have individual income of less than $157,500, or if you file jointly, it's income below $315,000. As long as your income for an individual taxpayer is less than $157,500, and your income for joint filers is $350,000, if it's below those two figures, then your qualified business income deduction is 
20% of qualified business income. Moving along here, there was a repeal of partnership technical, technical termination. So it says here, for partnership tax years starting January 1st, 2018, remember, if 50% or more of the partnership interest was sold within a 12 month period, the partnership was terminated for tax purposes. Now what happens is this, if there's a sale of 50% or more of the total interest in the partnership profits within a 12 month period, it does not automatically terminate the partnership. That's one that does not automatic, automatically terminate the partnership. And as far as tax exempt organizations go, please remember that tax exempt organizations are subject to excise taxes for highly paid individuals. So if you have an executive of a tax exempt organization who receives a salary over a million dollars and also certain parachute payments, payments if he was to leave the tax exempt organization, there will be an excise tax on that income that the highly paid executives of the non-for-profit, they'll have an excise tax placed on their compensation. Here's another thing. Tax exempt organizations must separately compute unrelated business taxable income. Now, under current law, a tax exempt organization computes its unrelated business taxable income on an aggregate basis, which effectively allows it to use deductions from one business activity to offset income for a different business activity. Now, under the new tax act, tax exempt organizations must now show separately the unrelated business income for each unrelated trade or business. So you used to be able to combine everything, but now if you have unrelated business income for different ventures, you have to show each one separately. And, all right, here's some changes as far as accounting methods. But tax years beginning after December 31st, 2017, taxpayers whose average gross receipts for the prior three year period who do not exceed 25 million may use the cash method of accounting, regardless of whether the purchase, produce, or sell merchandise. However, qualified personal service corporations no matter what their receipts are, no matter what their receipts are, please keep this in mind. That personal service corporations will be on a cash basis, no matter what their gross receipts are for the past three year period. Also, partnerships without C corporations, S corporations and other pass through entities can still use the cash basis of accounting. But partnerships who have a C corporation as a partner, all right, partnerships who have a C corporation as a partner, they are subject to the gross receipts test, which means that if the gross receipts for the prior three year period on average is more than 25 million, they must be on a accrual basis. So please remember that. And basically, those are the key things as far as the acts. Now, make sure you're aware. Now, when they start asking this in the first quarter of 19, the chances are they will start asking this and I don't think it'll be that complicated. But if they give you anything on this qualified business income deduction, make sure you know the rules because I think they're gonna ask that on the exam. They'll ask that, but it'll be once again, very basic, but be aware of it because the deduction is treated like it was a personal exemption, which means it reduces your taxable income. It doesn't reduce your tax. So, Megan, I think that covers it all. What do you think? I think so. No, and the reason that we know that that's going to be a highlighted item on the CPA exam going forward is they actually added a representative task for qualified business income into the regulation blueprint. So we know that it's going to be tested separately. Do you remember what the blueprint said exactly? Let me pull it up here. So let's let's make sure. By the way, according to this can be asked as a simulation. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. All right. Let's get that uh, blueprint up. 
So the blueprint is calculate the qualifying business income deduction for federal income tax purposes. So it's a simple one for as far as the blueprint is concerned. So make sure you know the complicated rules that underlie that seemingly simple blueprint item. And you know what? I think what they'll do is they'll give you income levels under the maximum. All right. I believe the maximum for a single was 157.5. And I think it was 350 or 300 for a joint filer. All right. As long as your income is under that, the individual can get a qualified business deduction of 20% of qualified business income. Qualified business income is basically your what? It is your taxable income. All right. That's what it is. Because it's your net income minus basically reasonable compensation. All right. And also it's minus your expenses of running a business. So really, in essence, it's taxable income. But you know what? I think if they give it to you, they're going to say the qualified business income is this. If they mm -hmm. give it to you, just take 20 percent of it. And you'll probably notice that first time they test this, it'll be under the income limitations. I discussed that with you. And therefore, you'll be able to get the deduction of 20% of the qualified business income. Yep. Right. And the other thing that I'll do really quick here is we'll pull up the 1040 that they have put out as a draft so that you can see what Phil is talking about with regards to it goes in right where the personal exemptions used to go. So let me pull that up really quick. You may be the first people seeing this 1040. Can we show them the front and the back? Of course. So the draft is from August 13th, 2018. And I will share that page with no, you. No, it is not the final draft. Is that correct? This is not the final draft. We should expect to see the final draft in the next couple of weeks. I'm assuming probably after the 15th of October, they'll start releasing the, the next round of drafts. All right, so if you go ahead and see here, here is the top part, the front side of the 1040. You'll notice that it's, it's only a half sheet this year. And then on the back side, by the way, can I mention one thing while you got that front thing up? Sure. Okay. All right. Let's go to the different filing statuses. All right. We still have single, married, filing, joint, married, filing, separate, head of household. But notice it just says qualifying widower. It doesn't say dependent child anymore because remember, all right, we no longer get deductions for dependents. So if you're a qualifying widower, generally, if you have an unmarried child that you are supporting, all right, and paying more than half the cost of the household, you can get the status of qualifying widower, all right? They took out the word dependent child. Do you see that? Yep, it should be right here. I kind of been pointing to it with yeah. my mouse there. All right. All right. Uh, they show you your wages. Now, notice they show you on this front page, Dependence per instruction. Now, this is the problem I see with this tax return. They really say you no longer deduct amount for dependents or personal exemption, uh, the taxpayer spouse and dependents, no personal exemptions. Yet, they want to know who your dependents are. And it says see instruction. I'll pull up the new instructions while we're chatting about the back so we can yeah. hop back to that topic. All right, we'll go ahead and share this back side of the 1040. Okay, now the second, all right, the second page, is this it? That's all right. it. So you list down your wages, your, your qualified dividends, any taxable IRAs, et cetera. Now, notice it says total income. Then it says adjusted gross income. Now, if you have no adjustments to income, enter the amount from line six. Otherwise, they want you to do what? Subtract one from line 36. Now, where is line 36? I don't see any line 36. I think is that's that where we're seeing it's still a draft. <laughs> All right. I think they're going to have either a list of your adjustments to arrive at AGI. All right. And probably be another form to show that. But I don't want you to think adjustments to arrive at AGI have not been totally repealed. All right. Some of them have like moving expenses. 
alimony paid, those are all gone. But you still can deduct some of your state and local taxes up to 10,000. You can still deduct your mortgage interest, but home equity loan interest is no longer deductible. So there still are adjustments arrived at AGI. So they gotta have some place on here to put those items. Now, what were you gonna say, Megan? So now we'll jump down to where this fits in, as, where it looks more like a exemption. So you see the standard deduction, itemized deduction line here, which is number line eight. eight. Next, line the, eight. Next, the next okay. line, line nine, is where this qualified business income deduction, C instructions, fits in. And then you'll notice the following line is the tax, taxable income. So it's, it's it's in its own category now, just like personal exemptions used to be. Well, the interesting thing you might say is why they take away the personal exemption deductions? Because taxpayers who exceeded certain income levels, all right, they were losing some of the amount of deduction for their personal exemptions. In fact, based on the real rich and famous and wealthy, rich and wealthy the same, right? All right, what happened was most of them totally lost their exemption deductions. They also found out that most of these multimillionaires who this was written for, they had a lot of pass through income. All right, a lot of pass through income. And there was a lot of partnerships, limited partnerships, that type of thing. All right, so you know what? In lieu of the personal exemption amount, they gave this 20% qualified business income deduction. And who has flow through income? People who invest in limited partnerships, that's where the income will flow through and they'll get a 20% deduction off of that. Now, if you have a lot of flow through income, millions of dollars, 20% of that is gonna be a major deduction, All right? Does that make sense? That makes sense. Now, that's not a political statement, all right? I don't want you to think I'm doing a political. Megan's looking at the instructions here, which are written in hieroglyphics. <laughs> and also, to interpret these rules, which they don't want you to be able to interpret them. Right, does it say anything? So here's the qualifying child section I was trying to pull up. It's still here, huh? Uh huh. So they, so we'll see how they um, adjust these as time goes on. Um, well, it says here the qualifying child of more than one person. It applies to the child tax credit, the head of household filing status, the credit for child and dependent care, the exclusion for dependent care benefits, the earned income credit. Is there any more to that? Nope. That's those are the five. So that's where you have to worry about it. Now, do, do you still have to know the requirements to be a dependent? I would say I wouldn't worry about it, okay? All right? They will tell you if the unmarried widow or widower has a child that qualifies them for that status. I think they'll say that. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today for the second round of these tax changes for the testing period starting in Q1 2019. And as always, we really appreciate your knowledge and experience, Phil, sharing with us some of these changes and how they apply to the CPA exam. Megan, if they have any questions, what can they do if they watch this? Well, and we hope that they do reach out to us. We would love you to go ahead and email us. You can email me directly at megan.l at jaegercpareview.com and we can connect you with someone on our team that would be able to answer any technical questions you have regarding this topic. If there's something that we think would benefit other students just like you, we'll go ahead and make another update video so that we can add that onto this series. And if you want to reach out to Phil directly, you're welcome to give him a call. He's happy to take your questions and comments Right, and my number is 301-874-4900. That's 301-874-4900, extension 5, 5, all right? And you can reach me generally seven days a week. And specifically, if it's a question on taxes, I will answer that question for you. 
So if you don't feel that emails, communicating between emails of people, communicating people with emails, whatever, all right? You want to talk to me? I'll talk to you. And remember, don't feel like you're bothering me because if you're bothering me, I would not tell you to call me, okay? We're the only course, by the way, where you can reach the owner directly. I verify. Try calling another course and say, I want to talk to the owner. All right, you know what they'll tell you? Uh, well, we just don't do that, you know? That's well, I'm pretty not, I, you know, I don't feel that I'm so important that I can't take your calls. I really will take your calls. All right, Megan, I'll let you go. What do you have to say? That's it. And feel free to get in touch with us. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you, everyone. Take care and have a pleasant evening.